Please welcome Mark, who will tell us about Hadoop. Well, hi. Uh, thanks for having me tonight. Um, yeah, so I will um, talk about a problem that we have. So, or during the last several months of building rate at the company I'm working for, and also my colleague who joined me here tonight. Um, um, yeah, I kind of experienced some key learning um, that was quite painful actually, and um, I wanted to share with you very honestly the, the learnings that we had. Um, so it's about misunderstanding the concept of a framework, it's about being trapped in your own thinking, and it's more specifically about how to not use Spark. Um, I chose the title Hadoop because of a very cool blog article actually I found that I wanted to cite here from Nick, uh, Nick Alpern, I think was his name, and um, that, was, that turned out to be very helpful for us. Um, I will start by um, giving you a brief overview of, of what Building Red actually is, and then about the state of our technology back in 2015, in the middle of 2015 and then what happened to us and how we, how we started to solve it, uh, uh, our problems and what you guys might maybe learn from that. So, um, yeah, Building Radar is a Munich-based startup. Um, it's an online search engine um, for construction um, projects and construction sites. And um, you can find or you can discover and track construction projects from, um, yeah, from design um, of a construction to realization in that every phase. And um, um, yeah, we, we do that because our customers are mainly, I don't know, for example, in this building you see there are lighting, uh, light solutions. Um, there is flooring on, uh, in here. And whenever big um, office buildings, for example, get built, then um, companies like Osram or other um, other um, companies want to know where these projects are and um, in which phase they are so that they con can contact architects or general contra uh, contractors and sell their products there. Uh, yeah, that's what we do. Um, to, to gather all this data we need for that, um, we um, crawl a lot of openly available databases, for example, um, tender databases or um, architect or construction building databases, but our primary source, of course, are home pages of architects and general contra uh, contractors. And they are around, I think alone in Germany, there are around um, 60,000 home pages or so. And um, yeah, we try to crawl them and process them and index them and make um, them available, make the data available for our customers. Um, yeah. Back in um, 2015, our goal for the end of 2016 was to actually um, process around 50 million items in total. Um, one item is one construction project in our case. Um, we were planning to have around um, 100,000 newly discovered items per day worldwide. And um, the most important design goal actually was to update our um, update the data into the product or into the search index for the customers once a day. Um, yeah, the, the architecture we were, we were building at this time was actually quite straightforward, it looked like this. It was divided into three main components, a, a crawling service or crawling services that ran all the time. They were quite dumb actually, they just discovered a domain, um, pulled the, H, the raw HTML data from it, compressed it, and then stored it to S3 all, uh, over and over again. Then the middle part was our monolithic Spark application, or PySpark application more specifically, um, that was versus subdivided in three steps, parsing, normalization, and merging. Um, in the parsing state, as such, we mainly grabbed the data from S3, um, decompressed it, um, extracted the values out of it that we wanted, um, applied some domain-specific processing, and um, then mapped it to our internal data structure. That then got forwarded to the normalization step that was all about domain agnostic processing. So, um, I don't know, we some, some, some string cleanings, for example, and um, for example, normalization of, con uh, of phone numbers or stuff that we had in these items. Um, but more importantly, also geocoding happened here. 
That meant um, for every address we found, we normalized the address, added um, geolocation for that, uh, which happened in an external geocoding service. And um, then also um, what quickly came up um, for us was data enhancement. In our case, that, meant, that means um, adding something new to the data item that we infer out of other data that is um, in this data item. Uh, in our case, for example, we, we, had, a, we had, had very soon a neural net in production that actually um, took description of a construction project from the architect homepage and, um, um, and applied a construction um, category to uh, out or interferred uh, construction category out of that. So, for example, if an architect writes about a cool, bright new um, hospital, then we map healthcare to that and return that um, to the data item. And then in the last step, um, we collected all our data and tried to merge um, building projects that came from different domains. So for example, if the architect writes about the same project and the general constructor, then we don't want to show that twice, but only once, and we tried to merge that in the last, in the last step. After that, we generated um, yeah, a huge dump, uh, also stored it back to F3, and then once a day imported it to our product, which basically was a, or is still a web app built around um, Elasticsearch, uh, where we regularly re-index it and yeah, we send our, our process data to our customers. Yeah, let's have a look at how, 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 that's all, how, how all that scaled. So um, in the middle of 2015, we, we started off very small with processing around one million items. This took around two hours and three slaves in Spark. Um, in the beginning of, of 2016, we scaled up the amount of data by 5x. And um, yeah, this already took us five hours on already 10 slaves. So here you can already see that it's not perfectly linear. It's worse than linear already. So the, the um, processing capacity increased by 8x around and the data, amount of data by 5x. And actually from this month on, it, were, it went worse every month. And we had a very nice exponential curve in pro processing capacity that we needed um, compared to actually the amount of data that we increased. And it um, finally um, ended in the middle of uh, 2016 um, with uh, around 20 million items. We crashed our main design goal of 24 hours reprocessing. And we could only do that by buying 30 huge slaves, actually, um, which was far too expensive because we had to run them basically all the time um, um, to, to come up with new data. Um, so at this talk, at, at, yeah, at, the, at the middle of 2016, we had really had to change something. We couldn't go on like that. And it was very hard time for us to evaluate what actually went wrong. Um, and yeah, what I want to, uh, to do is I want to share the learnings and um, what, what we found out. So the, uh, the next chapter is actually about self-deception and big data. And um, I wanted to, to start with a story that I actually once read. Um, it was um, during the 60s in the United States um, at the Apollo program. Um, they had a problem to solve. They wanted to go to the moon and um, they wanted to do EVA missions on the moon, um, meaning that they wanted to go out and walk around on the moon. And um, yeah, the expectation was that this could take up to several hours actually, and they were afraid that actually the astronauts had to go to the toilet at this time, and uh, which was not possible in their suit. So they didn't want to abort their mission because of such a thing. So they asked the engineers and um, they built some kind of aperture, and this aperture naturally came in three different sizes, small, medium, and big. And um, the problem with that was actually that, I mean, these astronauts were the cool guys, they would let shoot themselves uh, on top of a huge rocket into space, and um, then walk around on the moon there, there's no way that anything below size big would ever fit them. <laughs> so, um, yeah, they really had a problem, they couldn't land on the moon like that. And the way they solved the problem is actually they renamed these three sizes to um, big, huge, and insane. <laughs> and by doing so, they could solve the problem. As we all know, they landed on the moon eventually. And I think we have a quite similar problem with big data today. 
So if you're a cool startup or a more, uh, cool, more established company with a cool PR co um, department or marketing department, and or as a startup you need money from your investors and you do anything with data processing, I, did, I mean there's no way that you can process any data below big data. And um, yeah, so that's the first misconception. Um, make sure you really have to do, deal with big data. Um, the second thing is um, actually comes out from the same um, learning or from the same problem. If, if you're talking about processing a lot of data um, and you want to use it for your PR or whatever, um, you, you even think about how could, I, how could I even increase it, that it sounds even cooler, and um, calculate all the data you find and say, okay, we are processing that many terabytes or that many uh, petabytes of data. And the problem is you, if you talk about or think about all that all over and over again, then all, also the engineers at some point, I think they start to believe that they really have to do that. And, um, and, and think all, all the time basically how could you scale up your architecture. But very often it's far more intelligent to think about how could I actually process a lot less data by, by applying some intelligent algorithms to it and save a lot of processing time. So that's the first. Uh, the second misconception, do you really have to pro uh, reprocess all your data and, or can you find a way to actually drastically reduce that amount? Um, yeah, to map that to our, to, um, to our situ situation back then, actually we, we never had a big data problem at all. We had, we had a bottleneck, we had a huge bottleneck in the middle of the normalizer. And um, this was mainly network bound by, especially by the neural nets and, and the geocoding. And um, no matter how, how many uh, slaves we added to our Spark cluster, it would never help because actually the, the bottleneck was somewhere else. And um, um, yeah, the, all our CPUs were basically bored and wait, uh, waiting idle while um, the geocoder or, or also the neural net was doing all the work. And um, actually we could have solved that by using one huge machine, applying a simple asynchronous framework and run the middle part of the normalization on one huge machine. And if we had put a lot more effort into how, how to not reprocess all our data over and over again, we could have done that even on the medium-sized machine. Um, so actually this was one of the things. So think about the problem. The second thing is um, seeing, so actually I wanted to, to, to do that more general, so um, um, seeing a framework X as the solution for any big data problem. I think this is in general wrong this assumption and I want to talk specifically about Spark because that's what we went through. Um, seeing Spark as a general solution for any big uh, data problem that might occur is um, probably not right. Um, so in the case of Spark, what I mean with that is, um, do you have a map reduce problem? And especially the reduce part is, I think, interesting because this is what I consider one of the core strengths of Spark compared to other solutions that are out there. So for example, if you only need to map data, meaning you only need to parallelize data and um, want to process in a very parallelized way, there are, very, there are many, many cool other solutions out there you can consider. Um, for example, just sim simply having a message queue and running several um, workers on virtualized and Docker and managing that by, by, by Kubernetes, for example, basically does a similar job for you. Um, but then, of course, you don't have the reduced capabilities. And in our case, it turned out, as I'll come to that later, that we didn't need that. Another thing that becomes probably more and more um, a thing is um, do you really, can you really solve your problems with CPUs? This is what we also learned um, the hard way. I mean, we, we always plan actually to apply a lot of machine learning to, um, to enhance our data. And um, the thing is that most of these algorithms just don't run on GPU, uh, CPUs, at least not very fast. So you, have, you need um, GPUs for that or now new on Google Cloud and the TPUs. Um, but um, um, you will never handle that uh, with CPUs. So actually, when you have Spark, then you're then um, yeah, Spark. It's just not the domain of Spark to, to do anything with GPUs. So you have to 
use a service for that and then have your Spark cluster again waiting for the service to return, uh, which of course is not optimal and very expensive. Um, yeah. And then the third misconception that we had to learn is actually that uh, scaling with Spark will never be a problem. I mean, if you go on their homepage, they write, you can try it out on your laptop and then um, scale up to thousands of machines um, very easily and everything is beautifully abstracted from you so you never have to care about the scaling. And of course, that's not true. Um, there's a lot of engineering you have to do until you um, run a Spark shop on one thousandth of machine that has mainly to do with data distribution. It's what we learned and um, yeah, it's just not easy um, and it's just not running for itself. Um, so the map tab again to our, um, to our experience. Um, here I want to talk about the, uh, the thinking trap we went into. So we had a rather simple new feature that came up. Um, in our case, I, I could remember back, um, we, we have these tenders that were data items um, about a competition you can take place um, for construction stuff. And, um, and um, there is not only one address in this tender, but there is the tender of the one, the authority that files the tender, where it gets carried out. And if the tender is won by companies, then you have up to n um, addresses per per participant or per per um, winner of this tender. And so we had up to n addresses per data item we wanted to normalize and geocode. code. And um, yeah. We had a quite sophisticated data distribution already in our Spark, so that um, it was very evened out on how, how much time it took to process on one slate. And then we added this feature, and then this was all done. All this distribution was completely worthless, um, because um, yeah, and we had to start over again. So um, actually, in the end, um, implementing this simple feature that normally would only be a few other function calls, actually, to geocode, turned out to be two weeks of, of engineering and um, programming around. And um, yeah, in the end, it still led to runtime decrease per item. Um, and um, yeah, to, to uh, make, make the whole thing slower per batch that we processed. And then the interesting thing actually happened for us. At this point, we didn't think, OK, maybe the whole approach was wrong or something, or maybe we were doing it on the, whole, uh, on the wrong architecture. But we thought, OK, now that um, the processing is even more time consuming per item, um, we even need more the capabilities of Spark to scale up. So we were even more convinced that Spark is our solution, actually. So this was actually the wrong thing. And we did that over and over again until it completely um, did not move on like that. Uh, it wasn't possible anymore. And um, yeah, that, that was, that was um, very hard for us to, to learn that, actually. Was too much. So um, yeah, I, I said a lot of bad stuff about Spark. So um, to sum up, um, I wanted to first answer the question: Is Spark all evil? And uh, the clear answer to that is, of course not. Actually, um, I'm personally still a huge fan of that. Um, and it's a it's a very specific tool from my point of view of what I've learned for a specific set of problems. And um, I mean, we still use that every day at Building Radar. And now we use it quite successful, and um, um, yeah, especially for doing data science things with that, of course, and for really using the aggregation capabilities of Spark, but not to use it in a way that we um, first try to use it. Um, and um, yeah, so so far to Spark, in my opinion, to that. And um, then to wrap up the lessons learned. So what I think is very important is when you are, when you're confronting or when you're confronted with a new problem, evaluate all your options. So make first sure that your problem is really what it looks like, and um, maybe divide it into smaller problems. So the standard thing you do in computer science normally, and um, think about um, how 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 to how to how to how can you really solve it. Um, then maybe also check out other modern horizontal scalable solutions, uh, except Spark or except your framework X that you first considered, because there, there are really, really many out there, and most of them can do some things really, really good. And if you go a bit beyond the first front page or the first the, the home page of, of the project, you may soon find out also the disadvantages and where to not use it. 
And um, yeah, also make sure your, your problem is CPU bound or and does not maybe need um, GPUs or any other things in the future. And um, if all of that, if after all of that, uh, considering all these things, you come to the solution that Spark is still your framework, then that's completely fine. And I'm, I'm really, I really think that makes sense. Um, but then if you want to scale up fast, especially to the start startups maybe around here, if there are some, um, it me really makes a sense to have someone in your team who went already through all the scaling. Um, because you will hit a lot of problems and most either standard problems and an intelligent engineering team can always solve them. But you will be a lot faster if you have some people with experience there. Um, yeah, so that's everything from my side. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you very much for the cool talk. Do we have questions? I know there's pizza waiting, but <laughs> come on, you can still ask. Okay, first one. So how does your architecture look like now and how many machines are you using? I guess not the 30 big nodes, but no. what are you using? <coughs> So thanks a lot. So I kind of expected this question. That's why I prepared the backup slides. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, actually, until we really used our so first want to say until we really used our new architecture, we um, all the time thought that we would still need Spark, but um, we completely went to uh, a different architecture. So we have. Um, a lot more intelligent spiders, so crawl, uh, crawlers and parsers combined around here. Um, they are running on uh, doc, um, Docker, so there, there's one Docker per domain that we that we crawl, and they're managed by Kubernetes. Um, they process the data, map it to our internal data structure again, and save it to Cassandra now, and uh, register um, the ID of that to the message queue that then gets for, um, Hold by um, or yeah, consumed by the normalization and merging service that we have now. Um, and actually, the funny thing I already kind of teased uh, that in, in the talk. So this is really really small now. So the normalization and merging turned out to be uh, mainly network bound, and therefore it's um, I think yeah, it's running on on several hundred threads. But um, one thread is mainly worth waiting, and therefore we can run that. Um, if we have to process a lot, I think on on four four CPUs around. Or think we once needed eight CPUs, but that was super is super easy to scale up um, because it's also Dockerized, and it, um, then it uh, saves the results to Cassandra and also indexes it in Elastic for internal analysis. And then we again publish the item IDs in the message queue, and then it gets um, consumed by the product, which holds the data and indexes it um, in the, also in, in a separated elastic uh, index. Okay, I think we have, have one more question. No questions. Everything clear. Okay, so will we use Spark? We will. Not much. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I think we can explain it with our hunger. Uh, just before we go, uh, let me give a word to Ernst. He is a co-organizer from JetBrains for this event, so please. So, hey guys, so welcome to JetBrains. Um, I'm Ernest, I'm product marketing manager for uh, PyCharm. And the great thing is we actually have a very large amount of the PyCharm team members here today. Most of them usually work from another one of our office, but we just are planning here, so find the people wearing the JetBrains shirts or wearing JetBrains lanyards, they're all on the Bajor team. Um, then, yeah, we welcome here, this is one of our development offices. Um, in this part of the development office, we do generally do events like this or other meetups or other special events. And um, yeah, uh, come find us, come talk to us. And now I won't hold you up any longer. Pizza's right over there. Let's go grab some, and then after we have some pizza, let's continue with the talks. Thank you very much for coming.